Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about CKD management and progression. So in general, the management of chronic kidney disease in ADPKD is similar to that in other kidney diseases. And these measures include blood pressure control, use of organ protective therapies, dietary sodium intake, exercise, dietary protein, management of anemia, management of diabetes. And these are all uh, reviewed in other KDGO guidelines. Um, uh, reg regarding, okay, CKD management, um, uh, there should be optimal management of anemia to avoid transfusions that may result in sensitization. And um, hypoxia inducible factor prolol hydroxylase inhibitors should not routinely be used to manage anemia in uh, people with ADPKD um, because they make the cystic disease worse, theoretically. Um, management of diabetes should be the same as for people with other forms of chronic kidney disease with the possible exception that SEL2 inhibitors are not recommended at this time because of lack of uh, um, uh, safety data and the theoretical possibility that they'll make uh, the kidney cystic disease worse. Uh, lipid lowering therapy should be initiated in line with the uh, KDGO clinical practice guideline for lipid management. Uh, as for most other kidney diseases, kidney transplantation is the preferred treatment. Ideally, a transplant should be preemptive from a living donor. Uh, of course, um, uh, kidney exchange uh, may facilitate um, um, uh, transplantation, uh, as may um, uh, other kinds of swaps arranged by OPOs. Uh, excluding the diagnosis of ADPKD in potential living-related kidney donors is an important consideration. And um, this last point is something new, I think, that uh, we're recommending that the total in kidney, kidney and liver weight derived from the total kidney and liver volumes should be calculated and subtracted from the patient's total body weight for a more accurate assessment of weight and BMI. And this is particularly important for, for people who are on the margins of acceptance uh, based on uh, BMI. Um, these are some of the uh, post-transplant complications of uh, ADPKD, and uh, for sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but they're in the guideline uh, draft, and you can read about them and make your comments. Uh, regarding native nephrectomy, uh, we believe that native nephrectomy sh in uh, people with ADPKD should be performed only for specific indications where the benefit outweighs the risk. So recurrent and or severe kidney infection, symptomatic nephrolithiasis, recurrent and or severe kidney cyst bleeding, tractable pain, suspicion of kidney cancer, insufficient space for, recognition, for insertion of a kidney graft, recognizing that there's no objective data uh, that actually deals with what is insufficient space. Um, ventral hernia and the setting of massively enlarged kidneys and severe symptoms related to massively enlarged kidneys. And of course, decisions about nephrectomy and pre-transplant should be done with uh, shared uh, decision-making and likely multidisciplinary case conference. Um, immunosuppression should be the same in ADPKD as other transplant recipients. Um, Nephrectomy should be unilateral, if possible, um, when appropriate. And uh, we suggest that kidney transplant candidates with ADPKD undergo the procedure at the time of or after, but not before transplantation, whenever possible. So non-synchronous native nephrectomy, uh, that is when you're doing it not coincidence with a kidney transplant, <clears throat> needs to be uh, uh, associated with uh, shared decision-making and careful thought. Um, Hand-operated laparoscopic nephrectomy rather than open nephrectomy is the recommended uh, way to go. And that evaluation for renal cell carcinoma in pre-transplant people with ADPKD um, should be individualized and imaging of the kidneys within one year prior to transplant should be considered. Again, uh, more shared decision-making regarding choice of 
uh, kidney dialysis modality. Um, selection of dialysis, dialysis modality, either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, should be determined by patient-related factors, patient choice, and availability of facilities. Peritoneal dialysis should be considered as a viable kidney replacement therapy in PKD and caution indicated only when massive kidney and or liver enlargement or other standard PD conjugations are present. So people with ADPKD can undergo peritoneal dialysis. The prescription of hemodialysis and supportive therapies, uh, such as anticoagulation, should be the same as for people without ADPKD. Uh, I like this uh, diagram. Um, kind of illustrating the life course of ADPKD. So lifestyle interventions are very important. Uh, so low dietary sodium intake, BMI less than 25 and regular exercise, blood pressure reduction with ACE-ARB um, if they have a systolic blood pressure greater than 130 off medication, pain management, to, uh, you need to exclude an acute kidney event such as a cyst infection and then manage uh, chronic pain. And then treatment with tolvaptan for those that are eligible and uh, kidney replacement therapy as uh, appropriate. So tolvaptan, uh, we recommend initiating tolvaptan in adults uh, aged 18 to 55 with an estimated EGFR greater than or equal to 25, who have or are at risk for rapidly progressive disease. Risk of rapidly progressive disease is indicated by historical rapid EGFR decline with no other confounding cause other than ADPKD. And this is defined as a reliable EGFR decline greater than or equal to three mLs per minute per year over five years. Now, there is a legend to this figure, which I've not excluded, included in the slide, which gives a, a number of other factors which you can use to select for rapid progression. And um, if you have thoughts about this, we can talk about it in a question and answer period, and we'll please submit them for the uh, consideration by the guideline group. Um, and then, of course, uh, um, Mayo Class 1D or 1E and Mayo Class 1C with additional evidence of rapid progression. Uh, that would be an indication for treatment. If there's not a risk of rapid progression or there's definite slow progression, no treatment with tolbaptin. Um, uh, contraindications to tolbaptin should be re reviewed. These are uh, well known. I'm not going to read through this uh, list, but they should be gone through prior to offering tolbaptin to a, uh, a patient. So. Uh, initiation of tolvaptan at the lowest split dose regimen uh, and gradual titration uh, should be uh, done to, to permit adequate adaptation to aquaretic adverse events. Um, uh, target is a total daily dose of 90 milligrams upon waking and 30 milligrams eight hours later uh, as tolerated. And tolvaptan should be discontinued prior to pregnancy and to the, prior to the commencement of uh, kidney replacement therapy. Uh, physicians should be aware and educated, and people with ADPKD should be educated on uh, all of the uh, issues related to tolbaptan. And patients should receive information <clears throat> about drug-drug interactions. And patients should be, people with ADPKD should be educated about the um, adverse effects of tolvaptan related to urinary water loss and the need to drink enough water. Um, regarding um, uh, hepatotoxicity, uh, based on the country, um, there should be frequent monitoring <coughs> of liver function tests and uh, follow-up. In the uh, U.S. and Canada, there's a REMS-like program there's another program in Europe, and other countries have different programs. So um, in terms of the risk uh, benefits of tolvaptan, uh, there's a benefit of reducing EGFR decline, reducing the increase in total kidney volume, reduction in acute pain events, including stone and urinary tract infection. Harms or inconveniences, 
the ocaretic side effects, the risk of drug-induced hepatotoxicity, uh, the requirement of lifelong blood tests for monitoring LFTs, drug interactions, and uh, cost, uh, uh, particularly in countries where uh, tovaptin is not uh, fully reimbursed. Um, water intake should be adapted, that is, uh, in people who are not taking tovaptin, to achieve at least two liters of urine per day in those with an EGFR greater than or equal to 30 who do not have contraindications. And specific advice and education should be given on how much water to drink on a daily basis and how to achieve this. Uh, risk factors for fluid retention and or dilutional hyponatremia should be uh, evaluated prior to initiating high water intake. And uh, individuals with a, a more advanced CKD, G4, G5, or who have a clinical contraindication to high water intake uh, should drink to thirst and follow individualized advice. Um, and it's important to estimate the habitual daily fluid intake during evaluation of people with uh, ADPKD. Um, <clears throat> we recommend not using mammalian target of rapamycin mTOR inhibitors to slow kidney disease progression, ADPKD. We recommend not using statins specifically to slow disease progression, but of course you can use statins for treatment of hyperlipidemia. And we recommend not using met metformin specifically to slow the rate of disease progression uh, in people who do not have diabetes. Um, uh, this next one, we've already had some discussion about this on the work group. Um, uh, we suggest that somatostatin analogs should be prescribed only in people with ADPKD with severe symptoms due to massively enlarged kidneys to lower the growth rate of kidney cysts when no better options are available. And there's a, a recommendation that Dr. Rangan mentioned earlier about using somatostatin in polycystic liver disease. Um, and uh, these analogs should not be prescribed for the sole purpose of improving the rate of EGFR loss in people with ADPKD. And until there's uh, further evidence of efficacy and safety in ADPKD, we don't recommend using SGL2T inhibitors to slow the rate of EGFR decline. Uh, complementary medicines or supplements should not replace standard medical treatments. And uh, people with ADPKD should share or discuss their ongoing use of uh, complementary medicines with their healthcare team. And I can't think of how many times someone has downloaded something from the internet and, Dr. Perone, what do you think of this? <laughs> no. <laughs> So the take-home messages are that patient engagement with a multidisciplinary team is recommended for significant care decisions, such, such as choice of dialysis modality, nephrectomy, transplantation. Uh, management of the complications of chronic kidney disease and hyperlipidemia is similar to what has been proposed in the previous KDGO chronic kidney disease guideline. Personal dialysis should be considered as a viable kidney replacement therapy for people with ADPKD complicated by kidney failure, with caution indicated only when there is massive kidney and or liver enlargement. Prioritize preemptive live donor transplant and intervention using tovaptan as recommended for appropriate candidates. And a brief case vignette here. This is a 41-year-old male. He's got a positive family history of ADPKD. His father had ESRD, or kidney failure, at age 54. Patient has an EGFR of 49. He started tovaptin at the 45-15 uh, dosage. And due to tolerability issues and exacerbation of gout, his dose reluted, was reduced to 30-15, and he was started on allopurinol. Uh, he's tolerating this well with the plan to increase tovaptin dose when the uric acid levels have decreased and gout symptoms are stable. Thank you.
So we'll do questions later? Yeah. Okay.